The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground unperceived by your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. You may be wondering to yourself, how come his sermons are never printed in the bulletin so we can follow along? Well, the reason is that I write them up to be able to be read smoothly and easily on a braille display like the one I have up here. Unfortunately, that means eliminating lots of things that you braille-impaired people seem to find important, like uh, formatting and capitalization and stuff like that that makes extraneous dots and large spaces so the text is more difficult to read aloud. And I knew this. So this week I had vowed that I would have the sermon written in plenty of time to be able to get it reworked and put into the bulletin. Yeah, right. I had forgotten that this is Synod Assembly Week and I was going. So time kind of got away from me. So it didn't get uh, into the bulletin and I guess you'll just have to listen. Hopefully you can all hear me. One of the problems with getting just a few verses of the Gospels in a Sunday morning service is that you don't always have context. Take this morning's Gospel reason, uh, gospel reading, for example. Unless you were familiar with Matthew 10, or unless you looked back over the previous verses, you might not know that what Jesus is doing here is giving his apostles their marching orders. He's preparing them to head out and minister to a world he knows will be hostile. Once you know that, it makes more sense. Helps to explain the combination of warning and reassurance that we see here. And there is plenty of warning. As I said, Jesus is addressing his disciples, his apostles, and by extension, 
He's addressing us. These days, his words, although he uttered them a couple thousand years ago, speak to us. This is where we find out what we might expect from the world if we truly follow Jesus. This is where we find out, as I like to say, that the Christian walk is no cakewalk. It's where we find out how much it will cost us to follow Jesus. Remember Bonhoeffer called it the cost of discipleship. So let's take a look and see what we have in our gospel today. On the surface, verse 34 seems quite troubling. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. Really, Jesus? A sword? Why would someone who said that the greatest commandment was to love God and then love one another, why would he come with a sword? And why would the so-called Prince of Peace say flat out that he did not come to bring peace? Well, the 12 apostles whom he was addressing are, of course, all Jews. The Jews believed that when Messiah came, there would be a time of world peace. So they would have understood and perhaps expected Jesus to address this point first. Remember, they were an occupied nation and had good reason for wanting the Messiah to be a worldly warrior. But Lou, you say, Jesus does mention elsewhere in Scripture that he is a bringer of peace, doesn't he? Absolutely. It's often the first thing he says upon seeing the apostles, especially after the resurrection. Peace be with you. My peace I leave with you. It's a peace that surpasses all human understanding. But the peace that Jesus brings is not peace as the world knows it, which is simply a lack of conflict between nations. Those conflicts go all the way back to Cain and Abel, and they probably will continue until Jesus returns. The peace Jesus is talking about is a lack of conflict between us and God. We'll talk about what effect that can have later. But Jesus said not only is he not bringing the peace the world expects, but he's bringing a sword. This he means figuratively. You could probably plug in the word division or divider to better understand what he was saying. Jesus well knew that he would indeed be dividing people. Some would accept him. Many, perhaps most, would reject it. And some of those divisions would occur in families. Certainly that happens in countries where Christianity is not the prevailing religion. Egypt, China, Sierra Leone are places where Christians are killed all the time for Jesus' sake. We recognize many of them in our service here. But the really important thing that Christ does with that sword, that divider, is to divide his followers, his church, from the world. We are called apart. We are singled out. Our names were whispered by God before the worlds were formed, the Bible says. To simply say, well, everyone else does it or everyone else thinks this way, will no longer fly. Because now, we are held to God's standard, not the world's. And one of the things we need to do as a congregation is to help each other maintain that standard. A congregation, of course, is subject to the same group dynamics that any group of people experiences. We'll have disagreements with each other. We'll have bruised feelings over something someone said or didn't say. Satan understands division too. And if he can divide us against each other, we'll be too preoccupied to worry about following God's standard. We'll be so wrapped up in our disagreements and our bruised feelings 
that we fail in our mission. And our mission is always to proclaim and point the way to Christ. Jesus also says in this gospel passage, whoever acknowledges me here on earth, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. And whoever denies me here on earth, I will deny before my Father in heaven. Let's take care that whatever we do as a congregation promotes rather than detracts from acknowledging Christ. That needs to be our focus. The world will only be with us in so far as it is convenient for it to be. Pastor Elkin has mentioned this a number of times. As long as we're feeding the hungry and sheltering the homeless, everything's hunky-dory. That's what Christians are supposed to do in the world view. And indeed, we should be doing those things. Plenty of gospel to support that. But if we take positions that are contrary to the world's agenda, things get a bit dicey. Yet another reason why the Christian walk is not a cakewalk. We'll talk more about good division versus bad division in a bit, but I want to make sure we don't overlook what I consider to be not only the best passage in this morning's reading, but one of the best in all of Scripture. Verse 29 says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground unperceived by your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Don't be afraid. How many times do we see that phrase in the Bible? Lots. Most of the time, when angels appear to men, that's the first thing they say. Don't be afraid. It's okay. We know this is out of the ordinary for you, but it's okay. Don't be afraid. We're not here to hurt you. And Jesus makes a very special point of mentioning what we are worth to the Father. These are verses you want to grab onto and cling to. Because we often need to be reminded of just how much we are worth to God. We're going to need him just to get through this life. Jesus states categorically that there will be trouble. Right there in John 16, it says, in this world, you will have trouble. He doesn't say you might have trouble or it's possible things could get a little rough for you. He says, you will have trouble. But then immediately he says, cheer up. For I have overcome the world. I am your out. You know, Christ is the only religious figure that I know of who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Plenty of other religions about what we do and how we act. But Christianity is about what God has done, is doing, and will do says, the only way to the Father is through me. So does that mean that anyone who rejects Jesus or who never knew him in the first place, are they all going to hell? Great question. My answer is, I don't know. But that's not my call. And that's not your call. I'm pretty sure God can handle that. What we need to do is let him. But my point is, whatever else we disagree on, let us always agree on Christ. I just spent a couple of uh, interesting days at the Synod Assembly, and I had never been to one of those before. They hold them down in Sealands Grove, of course, on the Susquehanna University campus. Lots of Lutherans from different walks of life, clergy, laity, And as humans are wont to do, we didn't always agree with each other. Some of the issues are pretty thorny these days, like gay marriage and abortion. And one that actually did come up in the assembly, hydrofracking. Not exactly a major theological issue, but they had a resolution about it. And 
I'm sure there'd be lots of disagreement on those and other issues, even in our own con congregation here at St. Mark's. Yet we were all there, hundreds of us, in that auditorium, worshiping together, singing together, praying together, not because we saw eye to eye on everything, but because we all did agree that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everyone there was willing to let Christ divide them out from the world, as we all should be. That's good division. Here is some bad division we must watch out for. We all must take care not to let the world divide us from Christ. And it happens all the time. We all know how insistent the world can be. The people you work for make demands. Your spouse makes demands. Your kids have needs that you must fill. And even when you do that, they make demands. It's easy to lose sight of what is of real value. And it's not what the world has to offer, even though the TV says it is. It's not what the guy next door just got, even though he'll gladly tell you it's totally awesome. And I'm not saying don't ever watch TV, but make room in your life for Christ with Christian reading. There's a lot of really good, deep, interesting, meaningful Christian fiction out there. Make room for Christ with Bible reading and talking to God in prayer every day and talking to each other your fellow believers here at St. Mark's. Which brings me to one more bit of bad division we must be wary of. Just as we must take care not to let the world divide us from Christ, we must not let the world divide us from each other. This Christian walk is not something that we're supposed to do alone. We are here for God first, and then for each other. But all too easily we get caught up in so-and-so did something I didn't like, and he said this, and she said that. Of course, these are natural human reactions. But as a church, and as part of the body of Christ, we should be able to do better than that. And if we look to him first, we can it is intended that we are divided from the rest of the world. The sword Jesus brings sees to that. But let us not fall victim to the other divisions we discuss, the so-called bad divisions, division between each other and division between us and Christ. On those fronts, let us always strive to be united with him and with each other. Now, in a little while, when this, just before the service ends, we will sing the recessional hymn, which today is, This Is My Father's World. And it, like so many other hymns, provides a wonderfully concise glimpse of how things are. That last verse says, although the wrong seems oft, although the, although the, I forgot, I didn't write this part down, so. <laughs> but you'll see it in the hymn. Huh? Oh, right, thank you. Thank you, guys. Although the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. He says, God reigns, let the earth be glad. Amen. <laughs>